Is nothing but a magic shadow show Played in a box whose candle is the sun Round which we phantom figures come and go Tis all a checkerboard of nights and days Where destiny with men for pieces plays Hither and thither moves and mates and slays, and one by one back in the closet lays. The moving finger writes, and having writ, moves on, nor all thy piety nor wit. Shall lure it back to cancel half a line, nor all thy tears wash out a word of it. Seeing the singers kind of bumble around there and then come out with this beautiful song <laughs> reminds me of a joke of a man who brings his car into a mechanic. Uh, old mechanic and the mechanic takes about five minutes and fixes the problem and then writes out the bill for $50. And the man's outraged. He says, $50? It only took you five minutes to fix it. And the mechanic said, well, let me fix the bill here. And so he writes out, fixing the problem, $5. 40 years of experience, so I knew how to fix the problem, $45. <laughs> <clears throat> So they might have looked a little spontaneous, but there, <laughs> there was a whole lot behind it. This morning we're going to have another scripture, which is the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. This is a slightly different scripture, certainly one that uh, is of the four that we're going to talk about, the Gita, the Bible, Patanjali, and Omar Khayyam, um, of the four, is certainly the least known in the West, although the, the poem 
I don't know whether it still is, um, but at one time Fitzgerald's translation of it made it the most popular poem or poetry in the English language. And so many people know of the existence of the poem. They may even know some of the quatrains or some parts of the quatrains, but not very many are aware of its, in the West, are aware of its deeply mystical nature. That didn't really come out until Master came out with his translation of it. Now, it's different in the East. In the East, people who read the poetry of Omar Khayyam and of other mystics from Persia or from the Middle East knew of their not only deep, deep spiritual nature, but of the dual meaning, because in the time of Omar Khayyam, there were, as there still are, religious fundamentalists who were very, very orthodox in their thinking, and they would punish, imprison people who did not agree, or especially if they spoke publicly or wrote publicly, in seeming disagreement with the orthodox <coughs> interpretations. And people like Omar Khayyam were put in jail for writing mystical poetry that seemed to be in variance with the orthodox interpretation. And so they, being intelligent people, learned to put their mysticism in a very veiled form. And so there was a level at which the poem seemed to be addressing something completely different. But if you knew what was going on, there were symbolic phrases and symbolic words that meant something completely different. When Master <clears throat> found this out about mystical poetry of the Middle East, he was very, very interested because obviously he himself was a poet and he had interpreted the Gita and other scriptures, as we saw yesterday, showing that there were levels of meaning within them. And so when he found out that um, the quatrains of Omar Khayyam, the Rubaiyat, which the two mean the same, they're a poetry form that has four lines to it. And when he found out that there were dual meanings he found this out from a Persian scholar or poet in India, and he was very, very interested. And then he came upon a translation of uh, Omar Khayyam's poetry by uh, Fitzgerald. And in this particular one, there were 78 quatrains. Fitzgerald went on to do other translations of the poetry of Omar Khayyam, it's debated, but there are at least 1,200 quatrains. There may be as many as 2,000. And so what Fitzgerald did was to take a selection of those and put them down and uh, release that in an English translation. And it went nowhere. I mean, it was remaindered after its first printing. <clears throat> and so it seemed to be, not only did it go nowhere, it was going nowhere. But then a couple of other <coughs> well-known English poets saw it and picked it up and began talking about it and writing about it. And it became popular and then very popular. Fitzgerald went on to do five translations, five different translations of varying length of the Rubaiyats that he had come across. And Master looked at all of those, but of all of them, he felt that the English translation that came first from Fitzgerald was inspired translation, inspired poetry. He even went so far as to have someone who read ancient Persian translate for him the quatrains, but they didn't have the power or the depth of Fitzgerald's translations. And so Fitzgerald himself said that his translations were not meant to be literal, 
but to capture the essence of what, what each of those quatrains were saying. So Master taking uh, the Fitzgerald translation, then he said he was reading them or studying them in a deeply concentrated way and as if a window opened in his consciousness, the whole understanding of what was going on and of what the meaning was, he said that Omar Khayyam himself came to him and revealed what the inner meanings were. And so it was that um, there are these two levels. Read on one level, they seem to be not only kind of uh, not spiritual literature, but in fact intensely worldly literature. Over and over there are the suggestions that you drink a cup of wine or a jug of wine or a gallon of wine or <laughs> that, that you drink until your cup falls over. And then there are all the references to love and the maidens that you're going off with into the wilderness and uh, with a loaf of bread and a jug of wine. So Fitzgerald himself did not know the mystical meaning. And in his second translation, he said that it had come to his attention that there were deeply spiritual meanings to uh, what had been written and what he had translated. And he said, if you want to think that way, go ahead. And basically went on in that form. But the jug of wine, the wine is the joy, the joy of ecstasy. And the maiden and the love is Divine Mother and the devotion to Divine Mother. So we're going to hear these quatrains that, as I say on the surface, seem to be worldly and are purposely written that way because that's the way that Omar Khayyam could preserve his freedom. Now, he was not only a mystical poet, but he was a great thinker. He was a philosopher, a mathematician, an astronomer, and a poet. Interestingly, I found it very interesting. He was born exactly between the birth times of Yogananda as William the Conqueror and Swami as Henry. William the Conqueror was born in 1048. Uh, Omar Khayyam was born in 1068. And William was born in 1088. I think, I think Henry, Henry, I think those are the uh, right dates. At any rate, um, right in the middle. So he coexisted with Master and with Henry. Now, that time, remember yesterday we obviously talked about the Gita and a little bit of the timing of the Gita and how the Gita was written at the kind of end of a descending Dwapara Yuga. Then came Patanjali, then came Christ with the Bible. And the Bible was written, according to our calendar, soon after the birth of Christ. So Christ's birth was zero uh, in our calendar. But that was about 500 years into the, the descending Dwapara Yuga, or yeah, descending Dwapara Yuga, Kali Yuga, I'm sorry, De from Dwapara Yuga into, so it was close to, but not at the depth. The depth of, or I'm getting my dates a little wrong. The, the depth of Kali Yuga was around 500 AD, 499. And so Christ was about 500 years before that. Omar Khayyam was about 600 years after that. So the two were kind of just balanced in the great cycle with Kali Yuga at the depth. And then the Gita and Master coming uh, were kind of contemporaneous in, in a certain way, coming as William the Conqueror. At any rate, so the poetry that we're going to hear is... As, as we say, deeply, deeply mystical and of two levels. And so reading it, you have to 
kind of suspend your initial reaction to what the words mean and then understand. When Master interpreted it, he gave uh, kind of a, a translation or not a literal translation, but an explanation and then a deeper explanation. The, the book that we have for it is a wonderful, wonderful book. If you don't have this, I would really highly, highly recommend that you get it. It's one of the great writings of Master and of Swami Kriyananda, who took Master's writings and edited them into this beautiful form. The books that we have for this um, class series of Inner Renewal Week, it would be good for you to get them all. You know, that the end of class yesterday, we talked about Krishna saying, absorb yourself in me, worship me. This is part of the way to absorb yourself in the divine, is to use this beautiful scriptural literature as something that you bring into a daily part of your diet. This is as important to your soul as food is to your body. And so I would highly recommend that you do that. So... With that, I will end. Reminds me of a little uh, cartoon that uh, Vidur and I used to share during the court case days where you see from the kind of viewpoint of the scope of a hunter with the crosshairs, you see these two bears. And one of them is pointing at the other. One has a cheesy grin and is pointing at the other. And so without further ado... <laughs> And if we're lucky, if modern technology will work for us, one of my, we're going to hear <coughs> Swamiji singing verses from the Robat. Over the past number of years, one of my great joys has been to listen to Swami. Uh, he wrote a beautiful melody that Dharmadas sang to go with each of these quatrain, and then he uh, actually did a recording of the entire book, the Rubaiyat, and uh, it's, it's really a gift. And I've, over the years, I've listened to it over and over again. And I do want to mention before we go on that when we said yesterday that Master gave us these interpretations, commentaries of these four great scriptures, yes, Master gave them to us. But if it had not been for Swami Kriyananda, we would not have them. He took each one of these, put it into understandable language, went deep and into the poetry and into the uh, depth of the symbolism. And so he gave us these four great books. And uh, it's hard to say what is the greatest contribution of Swamiji's literary career, but certainly these rank very high among them. And I also do want to let you know, since we announced on Sw Sunday that Swami was not well, um, he's doing much better now. They seem to have gotten, he had double pneumonia, they seem to have gotten it in time, and he's recovering and still planning to fly to Italy on the 11th. Okay, so the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam. This is quite different from the Gita, but... <laughs> It's helpful to think of all the world's great scriptures as hubs on a wheel. And the outer rim, they're all, they all seem very different. But as they all move towards the center, they grow closer and closer, and you see they're arriving at the same goal, which is to know God. And when we look at the Bhagavad Gita, as we did yesterday, the symbolism uh, it, it's about a battle and a war and driving your chariot to freedom and choosing uh, to fight this, this war and looking at the warriors and so forth. Well, I don't think from starting point we could find anything a little farther away than the Rubaiyat. Because as we were explaining, it's couched in very worldly, sensual terms drunkenness and, and the, uh, the love and uh, the coming with the beloved and singing and coming into the tavern. But when we go to the end of the road, 
with both of these scriptures, we find they come to the same central point, and that's absorption in God. Because the symbolism, remember yesterday we said that the battlefield of Kurukshetra, Kurukshetra symbolizes the body. Well, Omar talks a whole lot about going into the tavern and drinking of the wine therein. The tavern is the symbol of the body. Going within is going into the spine and drinking the intoxicating bliss of God consciousness with the beloved, with the Lord. And so it's, if we can pick it up from that string, the whole of the scripture takes on an entirely different cast. And yet it's interesting because as Jyotish said, this is the most well-read poem in the English language, not even originally written in English. And yet, why is that? Because there, I remember in high school we read it. I had no idea what it was about. We also read the Gita in high school. I had a very nice high school. And um, <laughs> again, that was a little easier to understand. But this is so well read and so loved because in the very poetry of it, higher consciousness is contained. And in the very symbolism, our consciousness is raised and purified. And we don't know why that is, but it's, that's the power of spiritual awareness. Anything that you touch is imbued with higher consciousness. And so it is with these wonderful rubaiyat, or quatrain, of Omar Khayyam. So we have six, well, six questions or six points that we're going to cover. And after each of these, if this works, we're going to listen to Swamiji singing a stanza, a quatrain that is relevant to this topic, and then he'll paraphrase it. So we'll start off with the first point. The world of the senses is a delusion. <laughs> oh, come with old Kayan and leave the wise to talk. One thing is certain that light flies. One thing is certain and the rest is lies. The flower that once has blown forever dies. Paraphrase. Oh, follow the ancient way taught by Omar Khayyam, the way of destroying with a new vibration the incrustations of ignorance. Seek the direct experience of God and leave to dry theologians their absorption in abstract theoretical arguments. Behold this one flaming truth. All life is fleeting. Cling to that understanding and seek within yourself that which alone endures. During the short season of this earth life, Reap the lasting harvest of God wisdom. So, all of the great scriptures tell us that this world, the world of the senses, is not real. And I should say, not only the great scriptures, but the great physicists, the great scientists of our age, they all come to the same conclusion that the world of the senses is a shadow show. And in the Bhagavad Gita, it says, you who have come into this world false and fleeting. And it, it, they go on to call this world, in Sanskrit is Sukha Dukha Dham, the world of alternating pain and pleasure. And so Omar starts off, when we read him with discernment, with this thought that we enter into this world, but it leaves, it's fleeting, it's ephemeral. The things that we reach out for and perhaps even grasp them, fame, youth, wealth, success, 
We have them but for a little while, and then they are gone. And nothing that is in this world of, that is false and fleeting, this world of maya, and as we know, maya is from the Sanskrit word meaning the measurer, that which separates everything into little components. Once when I was first getting on the spiritual path, sometimes when we're first beginning, God gives us an experience to convince us that we're going in the right, right direction. And I had, been, um, I had been to Ananda the summer before, had liked it, but then wasn't convinced this is what I wanted to do with my life. And I went back to Sukaduka Dam, <laughs> where I had been living, and, and um, tried to see what was out there, and nothing, nothing worked. And then what, this was in Madison, Wisconsin. And I, one day, I picked up a copy of the Gospel of Ramakrishna, one of the great avatars of the last century. And I was sitting by this beautiful lake, reading the Gospel of Ramakrishna, saint of India, of uh, Calcutta, and for some time. And then I looked up. And for a brief period of time, I saw what was not the separate objects, but I saw what was connecting them all. And I saw that the beautiful lake and the boats and the people walking and the ducks and the children laughing, they were all the same thing. And it was joy. And it was just a little glimpse to say, there's a world beyond all the divisions. And that world is so filled with beauty and so filled with joy. But you have to work to get there. And that was when I decided to come back to Ananda and dedicate myself to the spiritual path. But we, we have people who call to us from this other world, the great saints, the great saviors, who say, you will never find what you're seeking in the world of the senses because it's not real. I've been reading a remarkable book called, some of you may have read it or read about it, called Proof of Heaven, a subtitle, A Neurosurgeon's Tale of the Afterlife. And it's a true story of a very, uh, just came out a few months ago, of a very highly respected neurosurgeon and neurologist who, within 24 hours, was thrown into this incredible physical challenge where they didn't really know what happened, but within his, his nervous system, his spine, and his brain, it was invaded by highly virulent bacteria. And within 24 hours, they had destroyed most of his brain, and he was in a coma. And absolutely no brain activity whatsoever. They kept him alive on life support because they didn't really understand what had happened. But the book is written so interestingly because they'll have one chapter will be about what's going on medically, and the next chapter is what he is experiencing on his inward journey. And in this journey, he talks about, first it's kind of a dark world that's a little bit well, quite unpleasant, but then he sees this orb of light and then he realizes that there is a tunnel and he can go through that light. And he emerges into this world, he said, beautiful beyond anything I can describe. It's as though this were my home and the earth was exile. And he said, the, and he, he said I wish I could help you. You could feel his deep, deep desire to convey what he had experienced. And he said, I wish I could help you to understand the difference between that world and this world, this, as we normally know it. And he said, the only way I can convey it is he said, remember back to your childhood when on a Saturday afternoon you'd go with your friends and you'd sit in a movie theater uh, all afternoon and watch movies, two-dimensional, and, and then you'd come out and it would be and it would be a beautiful summer day, and everything would be filled with warmth and beauty and, and experiences. He said, that's the difference between the world we usually live in, being in that dark, two-dimensional movie theater, and the world of the astral world that he traveled to. And that's just the first step. 
after the astral world is the world of consciousness of, of the causal world. And so this is what these great saviors are trying to tell us. Don't get stuck here. It's just a way station and quite unsatisfactory at that. <laughs> you will never find what you're seeking in the world of this world of the senses of delusion. So then the next question we ask, then what is the purpose of life? Why are we here? Let's see what Omar has to tell us. How long in infinite pursuit of this and that endeavor and dispute better be merry with the fruitful grape than sadden after none or oh, bitter fruit. Paraphrase. O oh, wandering soul, why waste incarnation struggling and competing in the pursuit of unquenchable desires? Why not simply be happy, divinely happy in yourself? Intoxicate your mind with the fruitful, salvation-yielding wine of ecstasy. How foolish to pass your life in the sadness of broken dreams, to live without ambition, to persist in bitterness merely because you once tasted the grief-inducing fruits of earthly desires. How foolish to renounce hope of any other fulfillment. So the solution then becomes, out of Master speaks of the anguishing sense of monotony, Oh, long, how long has this been going on? How long have we been deceived, reaching out for that unreachable happiness? Swami said uh, in another book that he wrote, the only thing that we can depend on with delusion is that it will always break its promise. And so we can count on that. If we take that as our starting point, whatever I'm going for in this world where everything shifts and changed, I can count on the fact that at the end it will be gone. And then where do I look? Where do I look for meaning in my life? And that's where all the scriptures, the Bible says, lo, you look here and there, but the kingdom of God is within you. And Omar is saying too, there is a source of happiness, but you have to go inside. You won't find it. But if you take the trouble and make the effort and have the faith that what you're looking for is inside. You know, so often we practice meditation and we can do it with a sense of perhaps um, dedication and discipline and doing the techniques and really trying with all that we've got. But we have to remember that what is the purpose of meditation? It's to taste the joy of our own being. And every time you sit to meditate, whether you're just a beginner or not, I remember the very first time in this lifetime I sat to meditate. Again, this took place in Madison, Wisconsin. I was finishing up college, and a friend of mine gave me the autobiography of a yogi to read. And, and I started reading it, and I thought, you know, I'd, I'd like to learn how to meditate. And so this friend said, okay, well, let's go to a church, and we can, we can meditate. And I didn't have any technique. I didn't know anything. But I sat there, and I sat to meditate, and this overwhelming joy just bubbled up within me. And I said to my friend, it's all inside yourself. And he had been meditating a few months already, so he was very experienced. And he said, 
He said, oh, no, no, you have to get these lessons in the mail, and you have to do this, and you have to do that. And I thought, oh, gosh, I, I thought it was just go inside, and there it was. He said, oh, no, 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 it's much more complicated than that. But in truth, it's not. And whether you've been meditating for one day or one year or 40 years, don't forget that that's why we meditate, to enter into that inner kingdom, to go inside the tavern, go uh, within the spine, and to feel within yourself who you really are. That's why these great saints come. It, as Swami says in one of his plays, The Jewel and the Lotus, they don't come to show us how different they are. They come to show us our own potential. And that's why once we get to the point of that anguishing monotony and how many lifetimes that takes is up to us. I'm sure we all know people that started off life similar to us, same background, same experiences, and yet they're still chasing. They're still chasing that carrot. You know, when I make my first million, then... I'm really going to relax and have a good life. Or when my grandchild gets into Harvard, you know, then I'll really have found fulfillment. But if we can just, why is it that it takes some people so long? My mother often asked that. She said, I don't understand why you weren't satisfied with everything that everyone around you was satisfied. And I had to apologize. I said, I don't know, Mom. I'm just not. It's not enough for me. And that probably, and nor for you, or you wouldn't be here. You would be pursuing all the little uh, potential of happiness out there. And so why do we come to this point? It's because we've walked it long enough and painfully enough and searchingly enough where we say there's got to be something more. But once we get to that point... What keeps us in bondage? What keeps us bound? Stanza 50. The ball no question makes of A's or no's, but right or left as strikes the player goes. And he that tossed thee down into the field, he knows about it all, he knows, he knows. Paraphrase. Those who live engrossed in life's game are governed by karmic law. They are played upon, they are not players in the game. In a ball game, what right says the ball? It must go where it is sent. In life's game, karma is the supreme and only player. Those who choose not to live guided by soul intuition from within, but who only react to outer circumstances, have little say as to how the game is played. They have opted to live in ego consciousness. Whatever happens to them now, whether pleasant or unpleasant, and whatever their behavior, whether righteous or unrighteous, has been decided for them already by their actions in the past. God alone, who first tossed our souls out onto the playing field of life, knows our entire future, what will befall us and when, and what our reactions will be as we weave the threads of our individual lives into the slowly developing tapestry of all life. Only the Creator, omniscient, omnipotent, and omnipresent, knows the beginning, middle, and end of each existence. So now the hubs of the wheel that seem to be so far apart, the Gita, and the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, they start coming closer together as they approach the central hub. Because who were the warriors 
of the forces of the Korovas of the negative army that were fighting our, aspir our aspiring soul qualities. They were past habits, attitudes, desires, the karmic play that we have to fulfill because we set it into motion. And so we need, not, and we also on uh, Thursday we'll be talking about Patanjali. And this again, it's overlapping again because what Patanjali tells us is that if we want to experience union with God, we have to control the reactive process. It's our karma that keeps us, like the ball, being hit back and forth. We, success, failure, health, disease, birth, death. Eternally, this will go on until we say, how do I break the bonds of karma? The first step is to pull back from the reactive process and to understand that we, to find freedom, we have to untie our consciousness from the post of egoic perception. So everything is happening to me. I have to react to it. You know, there's the beautiful story that many of us have heard of the Indian sadhu walking through the countryside, immersed in God intoxication. And he comes to a little village. And he um, has been living in the forest as an ascetic for many years. He has long matted locks and covered with ashes. And the little boys in the village begin teasing him. And they begin kind of trying to get him to react. And he just remains rooted in the bliss of himself. And then one of them, a little more aggressive, probably someone who eventually will become an uh, American football player, picks up a rock <laughs> and throws it and strikes the, the sadhu. And the sadhu just keeps on walking. And then, the, like sharks in the water who have tasted blood, the little boys start getting a taste of this. And they start throwing rocks at him. And one hits him in the head and, and, and causes the blood to flow. But the, the sadhu just keeps walking. And finally, uh, sometime after he leaves the village, he meets some of his disciples. And they see that he's wounded. And they said, Master, what happened to you? What happened? And he said, oh, we had such a good time in the village today. The boys were laughing and throwing stones. There was no consciousness of ego. Hold, that to, there, his consciousness was not tied to the post of ego. It was free, soaring. And so whatever happens to us, realize that, and no matter what, so often people say, yeah, but this happened to me. If this had happened to you, but everybody's got their own tests. And what may seem really hard for someone may seem easy to another and vice versa. But the, underneath it all, we have to stop asking the question, how will I react to this? You know what? It doesn't matter. It's going to be what it is, no matter how you react to it. And if you want to find freedom, you need to start developing that dispassion that where karma no longer has a hold on you. And as Master said, the yogi should be able to stand unshaken amidst the crash of breaking worlds. Well, how do you do that if there's no sense of individuality, of separation? All that's happening, all that you are, is the consciousness of the joy within your being. You know, we were recently, as you know, in India with Swamiji. And towards the end of our time with him, he started to get ill. And uh, he suffered uh, severe dizziness and nausea, very, very weak. And we had to still make the journey by car from Mumbai to Pune City, which is a drive of about two and a half hours, depending as we do in LA, same in India, you always have to use, depending on traffic, you know. And so we were driving and it was a very hard ride. And at one point he had to go to the bathroom and so we had to pull off, there were two cars, we were in tandem with him. And 
the only place we could find that was open that had a relatively clean bathroom was a McDonald's. So there we go into this Indian McDonald's and so I had to walk up the steps and there were people on either side helping him because he was very weak. And then he was coming down and I was sit standing at the bottom of the stairs and my heart was wrenched because he was so weak and it was such an effort to drag his body back to where he needed to be in this life of unceasing service. And then he just, I was looking up at him as he was coming down the stairs and, and he could barely move his feet. He's better now, but this was at this time. And he just looked up at me and he caught my eye, even in that moment. And he was like, there was this twinkle, this smile, as though to say, I'm not touched by this. Don't, don't be so concerned. And this is the state of one who has been able to move through all the labyrinth of, e of ego, bondage, of karma, and be able to fight the battle and stand there in the joy of his own being. So then we ask the question, we know what keeps us in bondage, but then what frees us? And Omar tells us, Stanza 31. Up from Earth's center through the seventh gate I rose, and on the throne of Saturn sate. And many knots unraveled by the road, but not the knot of human death and fate. Paraphrase. Through seven gates I passed on my long journey toward omnipresence. At the last of them, the mighty cranial light, I paused a while to view the road behind me and before. Many victories I had won along the way. Many profound insights had I gained. I had banished satanic ignorance from the kingdom of my consciousness. I no longer lived under the sway of physical desire. I found myself even now, however, not completely free from the influence of karmic law. So here the hubs are drawn to a close towards the center. Remember in the Gita, we talked about, and here he's mentioning king delusion, king material desire. And we, so the way, uh, what frees us is the science of yoga and meditation and Kriya Yoga. And if you didn't, if nothing else would convince you that this was a spiritually uh, symbolic book, Here's, he's referring, what are the seven gates? They're the seven chakras. Just as the, the, the five Pandava brothers and Krishna formed the, were the six uh, warriors for the Pandavas, although Krishna did not fight, now the seven gates are the same. It's a parallel teaching. The, the brothers each represent one of the chakras and each has a, of the Gita, the five of Pandava brothers that we talked about yesterday in the Gita. They represent each a chakra and a spiritual quality, the yamas, the dues of the spiritual path, and, or the, and the niyamas, the don'ts of the spiritual path. And these we'll talk about in our class on Patanjali but these are the first two chakras. These are our warriors in this battle against king material desire or satan king Satan, satanic power of delusion. The next chakra, the Manipur chakra, is fiery willpower. And so even though Omar may seem like, oh, kind of this poet and man of uh, dreams and so forth, he knows without fighting that battle, you will not overthrow the kingdom, uh, the king material desire from the kingdom of your soul. And then the next chakra, 
vi uh, the vitality or the heart's energy. This is the next Pandava brother. And then the throat chakra, calmness in psychological battle. Friends, develop this. If you want to stay on the spiritual path, this will be tested over and over again. Things will happen to you. We are in a battle. And with this calmness of psychological battle, whatever happens, you can look at head on. I remember uh, years ago when Ananda was burned down by a forest fire in 1976. I remember just, I, was, I can't say I had achieved calmness in psychological battle at that, that day as I watched everything we'd been building for seven years built, burnt to the ground. But then I was able to come, and Jatish and I were in, separated at different parts of the property. Finally, we were able to come together. And he looked at me, and there's a, the funny thing that he said, and then the more profound thing that he said, the funny thing, of course, is our house was a dome, and it leaked. And he said, we don't have to worry about leaks anymore. <laughs> but that was funny. But then what he said after that was calmness and psychological battle. I looked around at this disaster, and I said, where are we going to build the next community? And he looked at me so calmly, with a little puzzled that I would ask the question. And he said, well, right here. We'll rebuild it right here. And there wasn't any wavering in that. It was the calmness and psychological battle. And then Krishna, the Kathusta Chaitanya, is the cousin that guides the forces of the seven gates. And when they are all united, the yamas and the niyamas and fiery self-control and vitality and the heart's energy and calmness and God guiding us, then at the seventh chakra, the thousand-petal lotus, Remember it says in this verse, it's mystical, and read it again, listen to it again. It's verse 31, the most profound yogic treatise in all of the Omar Khayyam. On, here the king Saturn sat, sat. And this is, Saturn represents the downward pulling energy. But when all of our forces are united, we overthrow king Saturn, king material desire. And we reclaim our kingdom through yoga practice, through Kriya Yoga, just as we learned in the Bhagavad Gita. All the threads start coming together. And we begin to understand that by combining self-effort, understanding the yogic practices, going deep in them. You know, I have to share that I never stop learning something about the techniques, and, and I challenge you to do the same. Just keep going deeper with each one of them. Keep studying them. Keep listening about them. Make your yoga practice the highest priority in your life, because it's the way out. We can have all the best intentions in the world. We can be a really nice person. We can be really cheerful and all of those things. But if we are not making that deep effort, and if we went around the room right now, and I would be the first one to start and say, what excuse do you have for not making a deep spiritual effort? I could give you a lot of them. And if we went around the room, no doubt each one of us would have one. But friends, let's stop justifying ourselves. Time is short. That's what the Rubaiyat is telling us. If you can even throw away one excuse why you don't meditate as well as you should, that will be a huge victory. So what do we find at the end of this journey? Stanza 11. Here with a loaf of bread beneath the bough, a flask of wine, a book of verse and vow, 
beside me singing in the wilderness and wilderness is paradise now paraphrase withdraw your life force into the center of the tree of life the spine and bask there in the cool shade of inner peace. As the sensory tumult dies away, drink the wine of bliss from the flask of your devotion. Commune inwardly with your divine beloved. And in stillness, listen. For the singing blessedness will satisfy your every heart's desire and entertain you forever with melodies of perfect wisdom. One of the most famous verses in all of literature, but how little understood, but how profoundly beautiful in any case. So what does this verse mean, and how does it explain what we find at the end of the journey? Master explains the symbolism the loaf of bread is life force, prana, that we have under our control when we break the ties of the senses and we can use that to sustain us. The jug of wine, of course, as we've explained, is the wine of divine ecstasy, the drunkenness of feeling absorbed in God's bliss. The tree represents the spine, the bow, and similar symbolism used in a lot of yogic tradition. The tree represents the spine. You find this in the Gita. And the beloved is the beloved Lord who's with us there, singing when we withdraw into the inner world, we hear the beautiful sound of Om, the song of of love, the song of creation. And then finally, the wilderness. It's when we live in that inner silence. It doesn't matter where we are then. When we live in the inner silence, we can be in a throng of people. We can be all alone. But that inner silence is when we hear the own. We hear the bliss. We feel it. And interestingly, in that book I referred to earlier, um, Proof of Heaven, this doctor, Alexander, is his name, Eben Alexander, he said when he came out of the coma, and he had no experience of, he was kind of an agnostic, never went to church, but he said, I heard this sound, and I felt this presence, and I can only call it Om. He had no background in this whatsoever, but this Om guided him through the, this beautiful world he found himself in. So this, you know, it, it might do well just to sing this beautiful verse, repeat this verse, memorize it, because it's the goal that we're all going to, that beautiful astral, beyond astral causal experience where we feel ourselves in the beautiful freedom of inner bliss with our life force under our control through yoga practices. And we know that this life, the per we, uh, we have untied, we've moved through the world of the senses, gotten them under our control, realize that the purpose of life is to find the joy of our own being we look at our karmic obstacles that are impeding us from going as deeply as we would like, and we move forward. We untie them one by one, and we say, no more will you hold me, no more will I be, uh, as Sri Teshwar said, let the, he said, be a lion of self-control. Don't let the frogs of sense pleasures kick you around. And what frees us is the practice of yoga and meditation. And what we find at the end of the journey, just as we did with the Bhagavad Gita, you are so dear to me. Come to me. 
be with me because, because you are my beloved. And this is the promise of all the great scriptures. And finally, just to listen, what is the end game? The dissolution of the ego. And this will be the last selection that we'll listen to. One of the most famous verses from the Rubaiyat. Stanza 74. A moon of my delight, who knows no way. The moon of heaven is rising once again. How oft hereafter rising shall she look? Through this same garden after me in vain. Paraphrase A moon of divine joy, changeless forever in the inner heavens, the moon of night is rising once again. How oft hereafter in this same earthly garden constricting to the vastness of my spirit, will she seek me, but find me gone? For lo, the name of my native state now is omnipresence. So this is the Rubaiyat of Omar Khayyam, and it's how Master helped us to see just as the Gita is a pathway to merging with God, to knowing God, so too the, these Rubaiyat can show us the way to inner merging with the Beloved.